Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Friday, February 28th, 2020. And I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. Alright gang, well we're going to continue moving forward in my series on the quote-unquote giants or large hominids as I like to call them state by state and next up is Texas and Texas has some fascinating accounts and uh, we're going to take a look at them right away but I was just thinking about you know because I was looking into these you know extra molars in these uh, skulls of these uh, large hominids or giants and, you know, I'm thinking about our wisdom teeth as being, you know, these vestigial teeth is really serve no purpose other than to annoy us and, you know, rot out and have to be removed. And you would think we would evolve into, uh, you know, a state where this wouldn't occur, but... I guess not, but, you know, could the wisdom teeth be sort of vestigial leftover teeth from a time where, you know, jaws were maybe extended a bit further? Um, it seems to be, I mean, if you want to think about it a bit, you know, I mean, just look into dentistry and whatnot, there's been some, you know, thoughts about that, but... Could it be something left over from, you know, these large hominids? And, you know, they certainly integrated. You can't tell me that they didn't. Even if they lived in a two-tier society like the Adena and the Hobo, let's say, as archaeologists and anthropologists are now proposing... You don't think there was like hanky panky going on between, you know, the big ones and the little ones there and whatnot? Come on now. Get real. So, you know, this, this is what I say, you know, they integrated and, then, you know, I'm not the only one to propose these things. Just, you know, this guy on the website that I often look at, Greater Ancestors, yeah, Chris uh, Leslie, I believe his name is. And, you know, he says the same thing, you know, just you know, if you think about it a bit, you know, these sort of things would take place naturally in your mind if it wasn't infested by, you know, all the Nephilim and Anunnaki, you know, stuff that's going on, yeah, you know. The, you know, these people are walking around in, uh, with 14-inch sandals and stuff like that, you know, so. Like the Lovelock cave people who were exterminated by the Paiutes, you know. Any sort of genocide by the Native Americans towards any other peoples would be a black eye on those people and, you know. Very bad, but you know, to get back to the vestigial teeth and everything, I was, you know, I remember when I was like dating all these ladies in the entertainment industry. Yeah, I dated a bunch of ladies in the entertainment industry, so and you know, they always evaluating each other and whatnot, but like. You know, one of my girlfriends is telling me about you know, forehead girls, so I'm like, I'm like, what well, you know. What what the heck is forehead girls? You know what are you what are you talking about? You know, and you know she's just pointing out the difference in the female skull, really, and that you know the females have more smoothed out, prominent foreheads with the you know hairline up a bit. You know, some not all, but it's different in the skull type. You know, seems to be like that. You know, but. You know, could it be like, you know, the skull shape and type and everything be some vestigial leftover from, you know, interbreeding with other hominids? You know, we already know we've bred with Neanderthals and Denisovans so far 
that's you know so hey, look if you you know if that's happening you know you could sum up any other combination as long as you provide evidence of some other hominids and it certainly were that's what these accounts were all about but I thought that was like funny forehead girls I don't know they said it they look this is a picture of me when I was uh, like 30 years old. Yeah. I don't really have a lot of problems with ladies. Only see, I was a giant, a giant jerk. And, you know, it seems that a lot of the bad ones were always attracted to me. You know, beautiful, but, you know, bad. And that's a different story. But let's get to these, and a lot of people say they look like a little bit like Lee Horsley or even like Tom Hanks, but I think I'm better looking than both of those guys. I think. I don't know, but uh, my romantic exploits are legendary. To some, anyway. It's boring for me to talk about it. Giant skull from Victoria, Texas. Oh, no. A giant skull. And this is WPA workers, guys. So, you know, this is 1940s. Beach giant skull on Earth by WPA workers near Victoria. Believed to be largest ever found in the world. The normal head also found, which... <laughs> I don't know, just the way they title it there it makes it kind of funny. I don't know, to me anyway. But this, you know, again, it's, these things could be, you know, the um, the offspring of, you know, the giants, you know. It could be, you know, pubescent, you know, it's one of these uh, large hominids in uh, some stage of the pubescence, you know. And, you know, just what they're saying is a normal head is just a smaller version of, you know, a big one, just, you know, a kid, you know, a teenager or something like that. That Texas had a giant on the beach in the long ago appears probable from a large skull recently unearthed in a mound in Victoria County, believed to be the largest human skull ever found in the United States and possibly in the world. How many times have they said that? And how many of accounts we found skulls that were 40 inches in circumference? Twice the size of the skull of a normal man, the fragments were dug up by W. Duffin, archaeologist who is excavating a mound in Victoria County under a WPA project sponsored by the University of Texas. In the same mound and at the same level, a normal size skull was found. The pieces taken from the mound were reconstructed in a WPA laboratory under supervision of physical anthropologists. A study is being made to determine whether the a huge skull was that of a man belonged to a tribe of extraordinary large men or whether the skull was that of an abnormal member of a tribe, a case of giantism. So here you have, you know, the first like mention of giantism, right? And you'd heard nothing about this before the 40s or anything, but, you know, here, you know, trying to attribute to giantism. And I'm not even going to show you the photographs of the uh, Fiji chiefs there. They didn't look like they were suffering from giantism at all. It looked to me like they could break your neck like a dry twig, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't go that far quite yet. But here it seems to be the idea of it introduced, at least by the, you know, the time of this, this uh, article. 
Several large human body bones also have been unearthed at the site. Marcus P. B. Goldstein, physical anthropologist employed on the WPA project, formerly was an aide of Alish Herdlisker. Oh no. Curator of the National Museum of Physical Anthropology. And that's this jerkwad right here that I did a video about. And this guy here refused to believe that, they, that any evidence of man would be found before 4,000 4, or 5,000 years. Even in times where archaeologists all around the country were unearthing earlier evidence of earlier habitation he still refused to believe that and he suppressed so much archaeology including frank c hibbins work and here they're talking about uh this marcus b goldstein that you know was an aide of alice herdless girl i don't know and C.W. Saram's book, they said that the people who worked under Herlitzka, you know, said he was like Hitler. So, you know, maybe this guy was one of those guys. I don't know. Finds made through excavations in Texas are beginning to give weight to the theory that man lived in Texas 40,000 to 45,000 years ago, it is said. Okay, so this is 1940s, but uh, certainly anybody who is uh, under Alice Herdlishka would absolutely refuse to believe that. And so this is the San Antonio Express in 1940, I guess. And here's a sketch of the burials. So, you know, 20th century archaeology, you see this really large skull here, and I highly doubt it was giantism, as they were calling it back then, I guess. Burdick Track, Texas. This is an interesting one in contemporary. Giant human footprint taken from the Paluxy River located in Dinosaur Park near Glen Rose, Texas. It exceeds 18 inches in length. The cross-sectional cuts were used to determine through compression studies that it was a woman's footprint. Estimates indicate her stature at approximately 10 feet and 1,000 pounds. Unlike other tracks from the site, which were once thought to be human, but later shown to be dinosaur prints, this track clearly shows human toe marks. So you can see where they cross-section it to test it for compression and found it belonged to a huge female humanoid, obviously, because human, you know, homo sapiens are not 10 feet tall and 1,000 pounds, folks. So, can't be homo sapien. Some sort of humanoid from the past. So, fairly recent. Um, research done, I would imagine, there. <clears throat> they made them bigger in Seymour, Texas. A giant skeleton, 18 feet tall. Well, if a 10-footer weighed a 1,000 pounds, how, um, how much would an 18-footer way and if uh, you know a six eight hundred pound bear is throwing around a big giant boulder to look for worms or whatever it is i wonder what kind of boulders these people could throw around big ones i bet like glacial erratics no such thing folks 
1919, a giant skeleton 18 feet tall, Austin, Texas. If the report that the fossilized skeleton of a giant 18 feet tall has been found near Seymour, Texas is true, it is the most important ethnological discovery ever made in the world, remarked Dr. G. A. E. Pierce, professor of anthropology of the University of Texas. It would break all previous records of giants by nearly 10 feet, as the tallest man known to anthropological research was only 8 feet 5 inches in height. The skeleton is in possession of W.J. McKinney, Houston, Texas oil prospector who found it, and has been seen by a number of people who vouch for the truth of the size of the relic of a heretofore unknown race. Mr. McKinney, while making an excavation in the narrow watershed between the Brazos and Wichita rivers, came upon the fossilized skeleton near the surface. Mr. Kinney writes, I estimate that this man weighed from 2,000 to 2,500 pounds. According to my deductions, he lived about 2,800 years ago. The skull is six times the size of that of an ordinary man. Mr. McKinney does not explain how he arrived at the figures as to the probable period of the existence of this remarkable man. It is probable that the bones of the giant will be donated to the Smithsonian Institution, which under the direction of Dr. J. Walter Fuchs, is now conducting an anthropological research work in Texas. Kiss that one goodbye, folks. <laughs> goodbye. Where'd it go? I don't know. Uh, Mr. Felix, can we see that skeleton? Oops, lost it. It burned up. Sanders Mound, elongated skull. So here you see one of these skulls that we've talked so many times about in these accounts that they always say have the low sloping brow but you know they neglect to mention the back some of them do mention the back of the head and it be you know more you know capacity you know cubic centimeters in the skull so you know, these are the kind of skulls that the Galena people had and the Lovelock Cave people had and so many accounts we've read of these people and so many people found with these skull types. So here it is. Here's one of them with the dolichocephalic skulls and appear to be informed naturally. No artificial cranial deformation involved. It is definitely an unusual specimen with a significantly larger brain capacity, probably around the 2000 cc range, very similar to a Neanderthal skull and definitely human. The skull has all the right bones and sutures. It is very similar to Akhenaten skull and doesn't show any evidence of deformation. The one difference that I just noticed with Akhenaten skull is the occipital bone, which is supposed to be on the back of the head is on the bottom very peculiar okay which is often what they say about the brachycephalic skulls but it doesn't appear to be brachycephalic as cyclone Kobe has shown linguistic similarities in the at the Coppin language of the Texas Gulf Coast and ancient Egyptian the Atacapans were best represented by the abnormally large, powerful Karankawas who rescued Cabeza de Vaca's shipwrecked crew on the Texas coast in the 1520s. And I've done a video from C.W. Saran's book, The First American, because he talks about Cabeza de Vaca and his unbelievable journey through the southwestern part of the what we you know is now the United States through uh, and met all of these Indian tribes and lived to talk about it and talked about his account with two other companions who were shipwrecked there was always left of the crew of the Narvaez expedition who was an explorer so the, one of his first accounts was of a large people with giant bows. They fired an arrow at him when something, in, you know, like nine inches into the tree he was standing next to. So this is what they're talking about. And Cabeza de Vaca is somebody who's more or less 
um, downplayed in Spanish history because he more or less went back to Spain and ratted out the conquistadors for their brutality because he had been befriended by so many native peoples. You know, some were hostile and some kept them as slaves, but they were always released. They went on their way or whatever it is, but you know, they weren't killed, which is amazing. After eight years, these white Europeans wandering among these people, right? So. In any case, he went back to Spain and ratted them all out, and then, you know, they more or less said, you know, you're crazy, shut up, you know, whatever, we don't care. And it was, you know, C.W. Saran looked at him as one of his heroes, you know, he's the one that, you know, ratted out. But, and what a lot of people don't understand is that what Charles C. Mann pointed out in his book was is that. The Europeans knew they were giving the people the diseases that they were getting. It's not like they didn't know and said, oh, we got to quarantine ourselves because we're making these people sick. They said, oh, good, we're making these people sick and they have no defense against these things. They're dying from it. They knew about it. So in a way, it's a form of violence against the native people as well see there's a people say no it was they all got killed by but yes they all got killed by violence but the diseases that they got were a form of violence too because the all of the europeans comprehended quite quickly that they were giving the people the diseases you see and it's not like they were like whoa we better stop they said oh good like uh, the uh, guy who was uh, from Britain who was giving uh, Indian, you know, uh, native peoples up there in Canada and whatnot, these infected blankets with smallpox and whatnot. These are people you might want to look at in relations to giants in America, although they are not the red-haired giants of Nevada who were exterminated by the Paiutes around 800 A.D., if that's the real day. These people, the Karakaras, were well over six feet tall and their longbows could not be drawn by the average European. An early Texas account tells of Karankawa shooting an arrow completely through a black bear at 600 yards and that story was by no means unique. That is just uh, if you know anything about it, this is amazing. The Karakawas were finally exterminated in the 1840s because of their practice of stealing children and eating them. Okay, so this was not a practice limited to the Karakawas and the Tonkawas who were infamous for their non-ritual cannibalism, aided the destruction of the Comanches who shunned any form of cannibalism and were waging a genocidal war against the Tonkawa, okay, so, you know, again, more propaganda of cannibalism among these people with the perfect teeth and no cavities, they only wear on their teeth where they perform some sort of function with their teeth, and all dentists that look at the teeth say there's no possible way that they could have meat or any of these other things in their diet, they had to be eating some other things that were not um, s severely corrosive to the teeth, more like a vegetarian diet. That's what they say, not me. Dentists do. The big fish. This giant sized arrow or spear, dubbed the big fish, found in an early archaic cemetery me measures almost 12 inches long. This extremely skillful made artifact is fashioned from a highly unusual chert material of unknown source. Its fluted and edge ground stem resembles early fish tail. Paleo-Indian projectile points known from Central America, how and when this unique item found its way to the lower Guadalupe Valley on the central Texas coast is unknown. Robert Rickless believes that Big Fish was likely valued as a symbol of authority and that it was an heirloom piece that had been passed down through many generations. So, it's uh, artwork.
of the a giant sphere point, 12 inches, which is huge. Fish tails are usually arrow or dart points. These giant artifacts are dubbed ceremonial, which we've heard elsewhere from William A. Ritchie in New York here as votive. Not, he didn't say ceremonial, his terminology for it was votive. However, this just so story just does not, doesn't match the innumerable evidence evidences of giant artifacts. Ceremonial is a word used to discard giant size artifacts too large for today's weaker descendants. The giant size artifacts match the giant skeletons, which is so obvious. <laughs> They're votive and more dopey stories. <clears throat> Brownsville Giant Human Jaw, the Brownsville Daily Herald. Last week, one of our enterprising young land dealers, Embry Owen, in a company with Mr. Lowry, a student in the Mississippi University, took a pleasant drive to the mouth of the Rio Grande River on a pleasure and hunting trip and also took to, to look over that section of the country. On their trip, they saw a number of things to interest them and cause them to remember this voyage in their older days. Among the most interesting sights which they saw, or rather which they found, was the lower jaw of a giant human being who evidently lived here during the prehistoric days of this country. As Mr. Lowry is a medical student in the above-mentioned institution, he took this relic of ancient days with him to show his colleagues. The jawbone was found near the mouth of the Rio Grande River. They reported also that they had great sport in shooting the big swordfish when they came on the banks to bask in the sunshine. Mr. Owen has one of these swords and intends to keep it as a relic of this day's outing. <laughs> So, finding giant jaws and uh, hunting, basking swordfish are all in a day's work for a bunch of young guys way back when. It doesn't say from when, but finding jaw bones, large jaw bones all over the place at the uh, mouth of the Rio Grande. Hauling in 20 skeletons of a giant race, Texas Irrigation Project unearths giant skeletons. This appears to be from 1935, another 20th century. Harlington, Texas, more than 20 skeletons believe those of a race of Arankawas, giant grasshopper-eating Indians. So this is another story about these Indians. A lot of people say, well, they're vegetarians. No, they had to eat meat or whatever. Well, maybe they were eating insects too. Maybe part of their credo of their culture and their practices, we can't attribute the native peoples, the, the, the extant native peoples that came after them to any apply anything of theirs to these people who they didn't know anything about. So maybe one of their credos of their customs was not to eat human at all or meat of any kind. And they ate insects and vegetables. Insects just supplement their diet of vegetables. You see, cleaner, right? And even though insects, I guess, would be considered meat, but maybe, you know, is there any studies done on humans eating insects and how their teeth do or whatever? I don't know, but, you know, crunchy things, too, I guess. It's going to clean your teeth, you know, like your dog biscuits or something, like cement biscuits. The skeletons were unearthed during construction of an irrigation project and show the men were four to six inches taller than the average man of today. The Karankawes were said to have lived also on seafood, but are believed to have roamed the brush like animals, not building shelter of any kind. So who knows what, who is giving that information to them, but, you know, maybe whatever remnants of what they lived in were... Uh, destroyed in some catastrophe of which there were many.
apparently. Cobb Spring, 67 bodies, many measures, 70 feet. Find evidence of a giant race that once roamed Middle West. Austin, Texas, evidence of a race of giant warrior Indians which roamed the hills and plains of Texas nearly 1,000 years ago has been discovered by E.F. Pohl, archaeologist in excavations at Cobb Spring near Georgetown. Pohl, who has spent 20 years unearthing secrets of the Aborigines in the Southwest, says he has found skeletal remains of 67 bodies, many of which measured 7 feet. A number were in a common burial pit in a state of disorder, as if dumped in by a victorious enemy, after what Pohl believes was a defense of the spring more than eight centuries ago. Pohl, his wife, and crew of workers also uncovered uh, large numbers of arrowheads, spearheads, beads, hoes, hammers, drills, peace pipes, and clay pots. One of the pots is 53 inches in circumference. That's a mighty big pot. I bet you can cook up a lot of children that you kidnap in the middle of the night like the bogeyman that's under your bed. That one was for cooking up the kids. Yeah. This is an article from 1936, Spokane Daily Chronicle. So, you know, another 20th century. Much equipment. The teeth of the skeletons were in perfect condition, indicating they were of young men, possibly the flower of the tribe's braves. Moss agate or arrowheads, a material not indigenous to Texas, and an ornamented peace pipe of red pipe stone, the nearest known source of which is in Minnesota, and the article's cut off. And sometimes I guess that's the only thing they have of it. It's just a section of article. And I guess it's a repeat here. And uh, yeah, just another repeat from 1936. So 20th century again. Okay, last one. Biloxi State Park Tracks, 1975. Giant-sized footprints puzzle for scientists. So, know that these footprints, and this is 1975, and they're puzzling about these things, and, you know, you're not allowed these days. Again, you know, it almost went through like a rebirth. Interest in these things in the, you know, 60s and 70s. There's always interest before, and... You know, it seems so esoteric or whatever, and that sort of died off for a more sort of like politically correct attitude towards all this stuff. And, you know, whereas these things were taken seriously just a few years back, you know, now it's just, you know, order, you have to take one side or another or some take on it or whatever, but often not mine. And that's why I don't have 10 billion subscribers and, you know, people only want to see 11 minutes of this stuff. But I'm showing you the facts, folks. That's why my videos go through all these things, because I could just tell you about it or read your articles. But, you know, you need me to read you articles? I don't think so. I think you want to hear what I might say about some of this stuff. I think. Giant size footprints puzzle for scientists. Valley of the Giants did men 16 feet tall once roamed the Paluxy River around what is now Glen Rose, Somerville County. Dr. C.N. Doherty thinks so. For several years, he spent a couple of afternoons a week searching out and photographing the riverbed in Dinosaur State Park. Along with the tracks of these prehistoric monsters left in the soft limestone, there are also footprints of giant men. Dr. Doherty, who has written a book called Valley of the Giants, has photographed man-like tracks that measure 21 and a half inches in length. Paleontologists know that dinosaurs were on that area of Texas millions of years before man. Their tracks found in a great numbers along the Biloxi are accepted as authentic. As yet, however, scientists aren't ready to accept the man tracks as dating back to the dinosaur period. I cannot prove what I believe, Dr. Doherty says, but I do accept the fact that man and dinosaur, whatever, and I, okay, wait a second, it's continuing over here. Let me see. I don't know. It doesn't. So I guess it's cut off. But 
again, these tracks found with, again, with dinosaur tracks, you know, what is trying to be said here, and although, you know, what they may be taking as dinosaur tracks, okay, may be these large uh, megafauna from the Pleistocene and the early Holocene, where obviously there were these much larger animal and other species of animal that went extinct that were just so incredibly strange and that's not even accounting for the ones that lived in the oceans as well okay they only know a little bit about them you know god only knows when what went on in the past folks you know, if I might use that expression, you know, but, you know, it's a totally different world than anybody's thinking about. And, you know, this, uh, this elongated skull is just, you know, we hear about these skulls. And again, you know, the peoples had larger and thicker bones, were taller, um, often more strange than even this and you had the Adena which had a totally different skull form you know so just think about all this stuff folks I mean that's all I'm asking I mean that's all anybody's this fellow on this website or greater ancestors or uh, you know any of the researchers who whatever they believe you know, it's just whatever they're giving us as some sort of history of the past is within the time frames also, that they, whether it's the Adena or the Bell Beaker people in Europe, it's just, it's like a totally compartmentalized section of history that has like no relationship to anything else, even though they believe that the Bell Beaker people brought metallurgy with them. And there seems to be evidences, and I went over on this channel with the um, smelting and uh, of, of copper and other things, um, research done in those areas, okay, and the um, oxide ingots found in um, Michigan. So, you know, it's, these are all things, we're trying to put together such a big picture here, so... There's a lot to say about these things. You can go on my word or the word of an article or whatever it is, but I don't think you're going to hear the kind of things that you hear on my channel. And so far, nobody's done a series on the giants state by state or anywhere else on YouTube, I don't think. So, you know, this is, I guess, unique to my channel. But in any case, guys, I hope you like the video. Please hit the like button. And I will be back with a uh, new video for you, a new interesting video in between the Giants real soon, all right? Bugcat7 signing out. Thank you very much. Peace.